This screencasts This screencast design This screencast describes how to design a liquid-liquid extraction process in a column to avoid flooding of the column. And we're going to think about this in terms of the continuous phase and the dispersed phase as we have before. So we have droplets of the dispersed phase moving in, in the continuous phase. So these droplets correspond to dispersed phase. Everything else is the continuous phase. And of course, for a countercurrent separation, they're going to be moving in opposite directions. All right, so the dispersed phase needs to be moving up. The continuous phase needs to be moving down. Um, this could also be flipped around. It doesn't matter which phase is the, is the most dense here, because we're going to be analyzing this in terms of the difference in relative velocities. So you could flip this entire system around in terms of gravity, just so long as the two phases are moving relative to one another. Now we're going to be thinking about this whole system in terms of volume, volume fraction. So the amount of the volume of the process operated by one phase or the other. So if you think of the volume fraction of the dispersed phase, we're going to call that phi sub d. All right, so this is volume fraction of the dispersed phase. This is simply going to turn out to be equal to the flow rate, the total volumetric flow rate of the dispersed phase over the total volumetric flow rate of the continuous phase. So if the mass flow rate of the dispersed phase is equal to the amount of dispersed phase entering in the feed plus the amount of dispersed phase entering in the solvent, then the volumetric flow rate of the dispersed phase is simply going to be that over the density of the dispersed phase. And we divide by the volumetric flow rate of the continuous phase to get the volume fraction of the dispersed phase. And of course, we can also consider the volume fraction of the continuous phase, which is defined similarly. All right, so the way that we're going to analyze the system is we're going to look at the relative motion of the two phases. So if we consider a differential element um, of the continuous phase, then we can say that that element has a velocity. We can say that that element has a velocity, u d bar, and sim similarly for a differential element of the continuous phase, uh, we'll have a velocity of u c bar. All right, so the relative velocities of these two phases to one another is simply going to be the sum of u c bar and u d bar, assuming that these have, have vector signs, right? So we have a positive sign moving up and negative sign moving down. And again, we can flip the directions of these two phases. It, does, it doesn't matter which way they're going so long as they're moving relative to one another. All right, so each phase now has the superficial velocity described as follows. And by superficial velocity, I merely mean the velocity that the phase has if we were to consider it occupying the entire column. So if we were just pushing one phase through the column uh, from the top or from the bottom, then the velocity of that phase would be for the dispersed phase, we'll call it capital U sub D, and it's simply going to be equal to the total volumetric flow rate of the dispersed phase, so entering in both the feed and the solvent, over the density of the dispersed phase, so dividing by density, we get volume per unit time, and then divide by the area of the column. All right, so that gives us uh, linear velocity um, length per unit time that this phase is moving up or down the column. Again, assuming that it occupies the entire area of the column. All right, and the same for the continuous phase. The superficial velocity of the continuous phase is simply going to be equal to uh, mass flow rate entering in both streams, the feed, and the solvent over a density times area. Okay, we can relate these superficial velocities by simply allowing the each phase to only occupy the volume that it actually occupies, and that's given, of course, by the volume fraction.
all right? So the actual velocity of a differential element of the dispersed phase, this UD bar that we had up above, is going to be equal to the superficial velocity over the volume fraction occupied by the dispersed phase. All right, so the bigger the volume fraction, the more of the total column area the dispersed phase occupies when the volume fraction of the dispersed phase is one, then of course it's occupying the full area of the column and the actual velocity of a differential element is equal to the superficial velocity. All right, and then of course we can say that for the continuous phase, the superficial, the, the actual velocity of a differential element is equal to the superficial velocity over one minus the dispersed phase volume fraction, and this is of course because the volume fractions must add to one. Yeah, because they're fractions. The relative velocity of the two phases is then simply given by adding these two um, velocities of the differential element elements. So the relative velocity, which we will call ur bar, is equal to the sum of the differential of, of the um, velocity of a differential element, so ud bar plus uc bar. And we can relate this to the superficial velocity simply by adding them, them up. All right, so this is going to be capital UD over phi d plus uc over 1 minus phi d. It's a capital UC. All right, so if you'll recall when we analyzed vapor liquid um, column diameter, to, to look at flooding, we came up with this relationship that was based on the relative buoyancy of the two phases, drag between the two phases, and we were able to relate the relative velocity of the two phases um, to a density difference and a capacity parameter. All right, so you can do exactly the same sort of thing for a liquid-liquid system. You can, you can go back and look at how we set up the capacity parameter equation for a liquid vapor system. We're doing exactly the same physical balance, and we get that the relative velocity must then be equal to a capacity parameter times a density difference to the one half times a function that depends on phi sub d. All right, so this is the capacity parameter. And as with vapor liquid systems, it's largely empirical. And this function takes into account um, hindered flow from droplets that interact. All right, so this is a hindered flow function, and it also will largely be empirical. This row m up here is the mean velocity of the two phases, or the mean density of the two phases, right? And the mean density is simply given by the um, sum of the densities rated, weighted by the uh, volume fractions, right? So the mean density is just going to be the volume fraction of the dispersed phase times the density of the dispersed phase plus the volume fraction of the continuous phase, which is just one minus volume fraction of the dispersed phase times the density of the continuous phase. And if we take this term, plug it into this equation here, we get that the relative velocity of the two phases is equal to capacity parameter times phi c minus, uh, sorry, rho c minus rho d over rho c to the one-half times one minus phi d to the one-half times this hindered flow function f of one minus phi d. All right, it turns out that you can lump all of this and this into an empirical parameter that works out as a value called the characteristic rise velocity, which is denoted u sub zero times one minus phi d 
to the one half. Now flooding in this case simply means that the two phases are going to be pushing on each other such that the desired relative motion of the two phases is hindered. In other words, instead of having this desired relative flow of one phase to the other, you have one of the phases, either the continuous or the dispersed phase, pushing the other phase in the wrong direction. All right, so that, that's what flooding is defined as uh, in the case of this column. All right, so we're going to take this equation for the relative velocities, plug in this uh, largely empirical term, um, which is our characteristic rise velocity, and plug in our expression for the relative velocity in terms of our superficial velocities, which remember the relative velocity is equal to uh, ud over phi d plus uc over 1 minus phi d. And when we do that, we get the following, ud over phi d minus uc over 1 minus phi d is equal to u naught times 1 minus phi d. So what this equation gives us is a relationship between the superficial velocities and the volume fraction of the dispersed phase. So we can now design our liquid-liquid extraction in terms of the volume fraction. We know what a limit of the volume fraction on the dispersed phase is based on how these velocities are affected by that volume fraction. All right, so we can plot this equation, and what we're gonna plot, what we're gonna plot here is the normalized superficial velocity of the dispersed phase on the y-axis, and we're merely going to normalize the superficial velocity in terms of our characteristic rise, rise velocity. velocity. So on the y-axis, we have ud over uh, little u naught, and then on the x-axis, we're going to have phi d. So of course, phi d is going to go from 0 to 1 out here somewhere. All right. So given a fixed value of our normalized, um, our no or normalized continuous phase superficial velocity, all right, so we'll also normalize that in terms of characteristic rise velocity. If we plot this equation, we get a curve that looks like this. So the superficial velocity of the dispersed phase increases as the volume fraction of the dispersed phase increases until we reach a maximum and then it starts to drop. All right, so what's happening here is as we add more and more dispersed phase, the total velocity of the dispersed phase moving either up or down or the column on the column increases, right? As you were as you would expect because you're adding more dispersed phase until you reach a maximum. So this maximum represents the point at which the dispersed phase and the continuous phase are crowding each other out, and the continuous phase starts slowing down the dispersed phase. So this point here represents flooding. And you need to operate on the left-hand side of the flooding point if you want a non-hindered flow. All right, so what we've, what we've done here is we've essentially come up with this um, plot describing the point at which the column is going to flood as a fraction of the dispersed phase, as a function of the dispersed phase volume fraction. And of course, the volume fraction of the dispersed phase is related back to the relative flow rates of the dispersed and continuous phases. So this... Um, this argument regarding flooding and the flooding point of the column uh, gives you a limit on the design of the column in terms of the uh, ratio of the continuous uh, versus the dispersed phase.